as I said, this is a shear plate. If I build a building, certain of the walls are designated as shear walls. That's a part of the support of the building to keep it from collapsing this way or the other way. So in combination with the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid, this uh, bone is a shear wall. Right. <coughs> you will notice then that this vomer bone has a platform and it comes down and inserts into the posterior nasal spine. When we talk about the palatine bone in the Next bone we'll talk about. These two bones join with that one, so there's three bones come together right there at the posterior nasal spine. In the front, this bone comes down and joins the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid up here. It's said that it, it resembles a plowshare, so it's like the runner on a on a on a plow. On top of it, anteriorly rests the nasal septum, the cartilaginous septum. Now, there is some evidence, some belief that the cartilage of the septum has some input into the development of the nose, the nasal cavity. Cartilage is designed to take pressure and grow under pressure. But we do know that the nasal septum buckles and becomes deviated. We further have demonstrated that with orthodontic treatment, particularly with extraoral traction, that the whole floor of the nose can be lowered. And we've noticed also that at, during that treatment then the nasal septum will straighten out. So perhaps when the, when the maxilla fails to grow vertically and the cartilage and the vomer and the perpendicular and the ethmoid keeps growing, just like this, cool. it, will, it will buckle up. It will either go like this and buckle, or it will form an S shape and buckle, or, or twist like so. One of the things that happens when we have a bilateral cleft, this bomber that's ordinarily a plate becomes a column or a tube. Well, the reason is obvious. This must take tensorial stress. Tensorial means that it's coming from all directions. Therefore, if I have a premaxilla sticking out here, and you've all seen bilateral plaque, I have a knob out here, and it has to be supported. And when you do that, nature develops a flagpole. So we see its form converted as a result of function on it. Now the next thing is what happens in a cleft palate, posterior cleft palate. Here's a palate, I showed you one that was normal. Now here's one that has an, a isolated submucous posterior cleft. Now if you notice, it's not just a problem with the palatine bone, it's also a problem with the vomer bone. In 1948, we started a cleft palate team at the University of Illinois. I was brought in uh, for uh, mid sagittal x-rays and as a cephalometrist in the team. The Dr. Samuel Prusansky stayed with the team for the rest of his life. One of the things that uh, uh, really was interesting to me was the fact that children with bilateral clefts mm -hmm. Wide open clefts here, <coughs> protrusive maxillas. The speech wouldn't be too bad. <coughs> then we'd have a case like this with a submucous cleft palate. And the palate would, the soft palate would be present, but the patient would talk like this. Now, why was it that they had more speech problems with isolated posterior clefts and with submucous clefts? It was the vomer. In the, in the one with the protrusive uh, bilateral cleft, would hypertrophy and change its shape so there would not be a big space up there in the nasal cavity. And in these particular patients, the vomer would be missing. Well, in the submucous cleft, there's no baffler. There's no so you're talking into a hole. あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あ
So we learned that about anatomy and speech sounds. Now, if I have a submucous cleft, with an obtuse cranial base, I've got such a space up there that In other words, <coughs> the defect is on both ends. The throat wall is back.この渦巻きのような形で流れていっています。And the purpose of the scroll is to get the air moving in a circle. Because it has to be warm, it has to be moistened. So there's a lot of mucus, a lot of, uh, of uh, fluid in the nose, a lot of blood supply there. Notice how readily the nose will bleed. So it's there to clean and warm. And moisten the air, plus put it under a little pressure. Now, as it, as it comes through this nasal, nasal aperture through the nose here, it then expands as it warms, which also increases its pressure. Now it comes back to the back of the nose and it comes out the coena. These are the two coena. この2つの大きな穴が開いてますけども。The air has to come in here. このバルブのあるんですここにバルブがあるんです。ここでは鼻の形で。ここにバルブがあるんです。ここにバルブがあるんです。ここにバルブがあるんです。ここにバルブがあるんです。診断の時に重要な部分がここなんです。At the end of the inferior conscience. Because this is a critical place where the eddy currents come through. Right here would be the soft palate. Now, what happens in allergies and what happens in people that have chronic chronic drip, post nasal drip? Somebody saw it, you know. So, this is. It's my hand. I'm always got. そういう人はどうなってるかというと、この層状。So when that mucus is produced, it flops down on the back end of the palate. People think it's coming out of a sinus. That's not where it is. It's coming off of the inferior turbinate. And you will see these as hypertrophied inferior turbinates 
in the lateral head fin. Now, when the adenoid is right up against that inferior turbinate, the air that comes in from the top is restricted. You may have enough space in here inferiorly, but the air is coming down this way. So one of the critical places that you want to examine is the position of the adenoid relative to the inferior turbinate. It is really well to consider that you have the palatine bone so closely fitted to the maxilla that the two are one bone. Can you repeat that, please? I'm sorry. I was they listening. fit so closely together. With the what? With what? With the maxilla. Mm -hmm. It's ribbed on the inside for the attachment of the concha, and it forms the lateral wall of the coina, where it comes in contact with the medial pterygoid plate. So if you look up there on the screen, <coughs> right down here inside, you have the orbital. Part of the of the palatine bone right here, and then on the medial side you have the sphenoidal part. So that's what makes it difficult to visualize because it's not only intermediate back to the back, but it is all the way up to the orbit in front. Now I don't know whether you can see it in your skull, but if you look in the inferior orbital fissure, right up through here, you'll see there's a little bridge of bone. That goes over to the body of the sphenoid. Can you see it? Can you see that little body of bone that goes right across here? That is a buttress. And if you notice, it's right there at the apex of the body of the maxilla, right here. Now, the reason that I'm mentioning this is that when, particularly when you put a cervical strap on a patient for class 2. The maxilla rotates right from this point right here. Now in some of these section skulls you can see that a little bit better. But this has to do then with the palatine bone which receives the stress. In the case of uh, orthopedic tension in the maxilla, and when we uh, bring a maxilla forward, we actually open up that suture between the pterygoid plates. Now, this is a rather unique place, this whole posterior border of the maxilla, because as growth takes place, the maxilla slips down on a plane off of the pterygoid plates. In a newborn child, uh, the pterygoid plates are hanging down and the hook of the hamulus is hanging down into the oral cavity. This would be a buttress of the two pterygoid plates. The medial having a longer and a hook of the hamulus and the lateral having more of a wing like so. Now in the these are hanging down into the oral cavity. But as growth takes place, the maxilla slips right down. And look at your skulls and you'll see now, for instance, here's an adult male skull. And you see that the tuberosity is now down below the pterygoid plates, whereas in the child they're above it. So, now you understand the function of this, uh, ter uh, this palatine bone because it provides two sutures. But this is a slip joint, and So we have two sutures to work with at the tuberosity and not one. The second thing that we should recognize in the palatine bone is that if we want to move a maxilla back, we want it laterally to come around the pterygoid plates. Do you notice? So you see, this is not just in the vertical, but it's also in the transverse. That adjustments are made in the palatine bone between the maxilla 
and the base of the skull. This is at an angle. You see? See, this isn't straight across. This is at an oblique direction. See it? So as we move a maxilla back, it should be expanded, and it's brought lateral to the pterygoid plate. Remember what I said about the plates here, this medial plate, there's not much to it, except that it holds the hamulus. The lateral plate is where the muscles are attached. See the difference between the medial and lateral pterygoid plates. If you notice, it's curved. And it's a curved cross. Notice it's curved to support the cheek, but it also is ribbed so that it has forces coming across in this direction and carries forces in this direction. So it is a T or a cross for the curve. It is so closely attached to the maxilla that it is almost one bone. This is a very big triangle, and as the stresses come up through the maxilla, they are picked up and carried into this area of the cheek. Now, part of these are carried backward, and the master is attached below to it. But the other part is carried upward and forward up into the frontal bone. And what's this carry? It's a buttress for the bridge, the temporal crest. So this plane is holding the temporalis muscle. It presses down against this, this carried through here, and ultimately the forces then come into the teeth. This part right here is called the key ridge. But if you will notice very carefully, the part that you trace, a lot of times you think it is this part down here. What you see is actually this part of the zygote because that is an oblique line that doesn't come up as a line on your X-ray. This is called the, the Mailer or the Jugal process on the maxilla. And what you trace when we trace the key ridge is right around here and right around there. And if you notice, a lot of times that's right on the zygoma. And you can pass that around and you can see all of the attachment, how indeed very heavy the attachment of the maxilla is with the zygoma. When we trace orbitale, notice in your skulls, how far the zygoma runs to the floor of the orbit. So we think we're tracing the maxilla when we trace the key ridge and trace the lower border of the orbit. But actually we're registering the zygoma bone. That the zygomatic temporal suture is right in line with that. And it's right over the medial of the pterygoid plates. You all see that? So this plane right here, separating the parietal bone from the frontal, the temporal from the great wing of the sphenoid, the zygoma from the temporal, and the pterygoid plates from the maxilla are the coronal suture. Everything with growth behind that grows in this direction. Everything in front grows in this direction. So we established many years ago the pterygoid vertical line, which theoretically represents the coronal suture division. Now the maxilla is different from the mandible altogether. If we look at a mandible, it's heavy. It's dense. It is functional all the time because it's a very active bone. Why? Because it has to support all of the organs of respiration. 
It has many muscles attached to it. まただくさんの筋肉が化学に付着しています。So it has to be big and strong and firm. By contrast, the maxilla is thin and light. It's even hollowed out. It has a sinus in it. Therefore, it is passive. It is only there to receive stresses from the teeth, and it is an intermediate bone, therefore, between the base of the skull where the muscles are attached and where the teeth actually meet. Now it also holds some of the facial muscles, uh, the uh, superior quadratus, which has three heads. Then there's one out here to the zygoma, the zygomaticus, and some little ones that come across the lip down in here, like the incisivus muscles. There are a few little muscles around the nose that attach to it. But there's really no muscles of mastication bear directly on the maxilla, and so it is a passive bone. Now it is thickened and reinforced then at the points where the stresses run through the plates, the outer plates of the bone. Okay, so stresses come up through the bone. And I describe three circles of stresses that come through the maxilla. If you will notice, right in back of the internasal spine, the bone is thick. In other words, you come up a little bit from the spine, and then it goes down a little bit. That's a stress line that runs between the two canines. Right between the roots. The apex and the two canines. There's a circle of stress that includes the canines. The next stress line is one that goes up around the piriform aperture up to the nasal bone. So there's one here, one here. Now the next one here runs. Comes up through the maxilla and goes out under the orbit. Then it comes up to the frontal bone. So that's a circle of stress. Finally, then, there's a circle of stress that runs back up through the zygoma, back up to the temporal bone, which is one circle behind that. So there's a group of of stresses that hold the skull together. The frontal bone, then, is the bridge. Now again, how much of this bone is alveolar process? Unfortunately, I had an edentulous skull here that was a beautiful, beautiful exhibit, and it was an edentulous uh, with teeth gone for some time, and the resorption was all the way up into here, and the palate was paper thin. So when the teeth are lost in the maxilla, it's just amazing how little of it's left. Once you study it this way, you become convinced that the best thing is to get a patient to preserve the teeth all their life. Have you ever seen a patient that wore a full upper denture against a lower natural denture? It just pounds us to pieces. So the worst teeth to lose are the upper teeth. What are usually the last teeth to be lost? The lower incisor segment. We studied 1,150 uh, older people in the veterans' hospital. It used to be before we had fluorides that you could have uh, decay all over the place, and it was likely that you lost by cuspids early. Well, they get infected. But past age 35, teeth are lost because of periodontal disease. Age groups past 70 still have a lot of edentulism. I used to think it was old. <laughs> Now you're not old until you're 90. I wonder what I'll say when I'm 90. So the very last teeth to be lost are the lower incisors. And the lower anterior segment. Which teeth do we worry about crowding? The most lower incisor. Orthodontic case: patient comes in, got a little crowding in the lower incisor. Oh, my teeth are crooked. 
I'm going to lose my teeth. Those are the last ones we're going to lose. They're the ones we have to worry about the most. Even if we tear down disease, those teeth don't seem to, to be lost. Maybe it's just the, the amount of blood supply we have, but also these teeth are highly proprioceptive. And the mandible will do its best to avoid trauma to those teeth. Even the uppers will suffer before the lowers will. Because when you bite down, the uppers are not biting down the long axis of the tooth. So it's an interesting phenomenon about the teeth. Now the next thing is to view the maxilla and imagine what happens to it now when we put a distal force on the upper first molar. What is the frequency of class 2 in your practice? Didn't I say the other day you have a lot of class 1, division 1s? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> I, noticed, I noticed it when I was there. You have a protrusion of the upper incisors, but you have class 1 molars. The canines will be class 2, the molars will be class 1. And on. I've seen a lot of them over there. What's your percentage of class 3? 30%? I have 2%. 2% of my cases are class 3. 60% are class 2. The rest of them are class 1. So we have more class 2s. We have more of a convexity. But you still have class 2. Now, do you have convexity with that, or is that a dental class 2? Is the maxilla forward, or is the mandible back? Mandible's back. All right. Then you end up extracting a lot in class twos. Theoretically. Okay, well, let's look because it's my stand that the best treatment in many of these patients is early treatment with extra oral therapy. Now, the opposite is true for the class three. And that 2%. I'll start with the quad helix. And then we will put on a face mask to get the maxilla forward. It still rests against the chin, so possibly we've got a little bit of an inhibition of forward growth of the mandible. But we don't stop until we get it over-treated. Now the interesting thing about it is that this the quad helix and extra oral therapy for class 2 splits the palate. The main reason is because as you go back, you're going into a wider part of the arch. Perhaps if you started them early, there would be less of them that you'd have to take teeth out of. Now, if you can bring the whole maxilla back, starting at 7, 8, Eight and a half, nine. Widen the arches. The thing that impresses me about my oriental patients is the space that I have to work with back in here because you have wide mandibles. 